This episode of the World War II podcast is brought to you by Hillsdale. For information on their new course, Winston Churchill and Statesmanship, go to hillsdale.edu slash ww2podcast. Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we'll be looking at the use of gliders during the war and I'm joined by Matt Yates. Matt is a member of Chalk, a living history group in the northeast of England who specialised in the British Glider Regiment and its activities from 1942 to 1945. I have to say, other than watching films like A Bridge Too Far and The Longest Day, I know very little about gliders and their use. So Matt, where did the idea of using gliders come from? Basically, the Allies started using gliders as a direct result of, of seeing the Germans use them. Uh, and the Germans had been using gliders since the late 1920s. And that was obviously because they were forbidden uh, by the Treaty of Versailles to, to train pilots, uh, powered pilots. But they were allowed to glide. So it took off massively in a, in a typical kind of uh, Teutonic sports way. And then they developed the first troop carrying gliders, which they used in Belgium. Uh, where was the other one? Crete. Very effectively. The British had been watching this. The age old story, of course, is that Churchill then issued an order to raise an airborne force of so many paratroopers, so many glider born. In the very, very early days, uh, in, the, in 1940, 1941, they basically had to beg, borrow and steal gliders, sailplanes, not even gliders, but sailplanes from all over uh, private, all over the country at private uh, gliding clubs, where they then trained them at Ringway in Manchester. The regiment itself was formed in february of 1942 it was formed before the parachute regiment the parachute regiment was formed in august of 1942 their first uh, operational mission was operation freshman which is in norway a flight over to the um, the hard water uh, factory in norway it was unsuccessful and uh, you know that's a that's a that's a completely different conversation that's not the film um uh, uh heroes of telemark yeah. No, Heroes of Telemark is based on what happened after Operation Freshman failed. Um, it's the same. It's the same factory. It's the same hard water factory. It, there's an awful lot of um, artist license in that film, but uh, initially they'd flown two gliders with engineers, and it, it just failed terribly. The ones that survived, the, the, the both aircraft crashed. And the ones that survived were taken by the local Gestapo. This was just after Hitler had released his commando order, which was any Allied commandos that were caught were to be shot on sight. It was literally just after he'd released it. And the local Wehrmacht didn't know what to do. The Gestapo believed that they should be killed on sight. Um, there was a lot of pulling and tugging in different directions. And eventually they were all murdered by the Germans and their bodies were dumped in the uh, in the sea. So it wasn't a great start for the uh, for the regiment. On, on that flight, there was two gliders. They had two glider pilot regiment pilots, and they had two Australian RAF pilots flying the other glider. So the, the basic reasoning behind glider warfare is that it's a, a, a cheap, relatively cheap way of getting a lot of equipment behind enemy lines very quickly and also keeping it all together. If you drop a stick of paras from an aircraft, they're spread out over a wide area. If there's winds, if the aircraft, if the aircraft's taking uh, action through flak and things like that, those paratroopers can be spread all over the place. With a glider, you can land 20-odd men or, or less men with vehicles and, and equipment in one spot very quickly and very concisely. Initially, they started off with a Hotspur glider, um, which was built for the job. It carried eight men. It was based on the German DFS 230. It was discovered very quickly that it wouldn't be suitable for what the Allies had in mind. The Allies had a bigger idea for airborne forces than the Germans. Uh, and, and as we know, after after Crete... What was the initial German operations? How did they go? Uh, very well. Uh, Ebanimal, which was the huge uh, fortification uh, on the Belgian frontier, was taken very quickly by paratroopers and by gliders in 1940. Can't remember the month. I think it was May. I think it might, it might have been May, actually. Yeah, and that was taken very well indeed. That was taken very quickly, very succinctly. The whole operation was over very quickly. In Crete, the gliders performed well. The operation as a whole, although it was successful and the Germans managed to take Crete, they lost an awful lot of men and they lost an awful lot of equipment. So at that point, the story goes that Hitler had put an embargo on using airborne forces to that degree. 
How many gliders were used in Crete? Was it a big operation? I, 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 my 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 thinking is, uh, I was thinking about uh, how they, the you know, the the doctrine of how they actually used them, and you, you I was wondering if there's, there's actually two different um, ways of using them. There, you've got the the fort on Belgium. There's you know a handful, ten gliders, or whatever, drop in, very surgical strike. Whereas Crete is just a mass airborne operation. So I was going to say, is it, might it be better, you know, were they better used in one than the other? Personally speaking, I think since I've been sort of researching glider warfare, because it's not just British, I'm, I'm, I'm also trying to pull in more information on German and American uh, glider warfare. And since I've been looking at it, it always seems to me that the coup de main operations by whichever nation always work the best. Massive airborne assaults just don't seem to work. I mean, D-Day worked, but the the, the main airborne assault in, involving the gliders came in at night. It, ca- it came in in the evening. It was it was sort of eight p.m. at night. Whereas the 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 coup de main assault on all the bridges took place, uh, you know, at, at midnight on the on the fifth sixth. Um, and they were successful. The, the the following day, as these masses and hundreds and hundreds of gliders came in, really everybody was on the beach. The beachheads were taken, um, and that's when the gliders came in. Then you look at, at Arnhem. If they'd have managed to do it all in one day, it would have worked a treat. But because they took two or three lifts to, to do the whole thing, you've lost the element of surprise, and, and we all know what happened at Arnhem. Varsity, on the other hand, in 1945, a lot of people argue that that operation was unnecessary for the Allies to carry out as an airborne operation. But well, they'd already captured the bridge at uh, Remag. They'd all, all already captured the bridge. A week earlier. Yeah, but they, they, you know, they needed to get a massive force over the river and into Germany. And I think that when you look at that operation, with it all working simultaneously, you've got your amphibious force going across the river, your land forces, you've got your airborne forces coming over all simultaneously, all working together. Everybody linked up within, within a, you know, a matter of hours, really, on the ground. It, it worked well. The airborne, the airborne forces, particularly the gliders, came across extraordinarily heavy flak on that operation they lost a lot of men and they lost a lot of machinery really you're looking at at, at massive numbers making that work rather than the strategy of the operation you know it's 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 the biggest airborne assault ever in history and yet (laughs) nobody knows about it (laughs) when you do the displays it's all d-day and arnhem and very very few people are aware of uh, of of crossing the rhine in 1945 I get the feeling there was not a lot of jeopardy. It was such overwhelming force that there was not a lot to be said. We we, we crossed, we won. Whereas you know, even the the, the crossing at um, it is, I think it is Remagen, isn't it? After the film, uh, uh, was even that was a better story because it was a bit more touch and go. Uh, whether they got across, and they eventually got off, and then then to top it all. Uh, they held the bridge, they put up another one, and then that bridge fell down. So, I mean, it's quite a, a, an exciting story. Whereas, yeah, we just sent a load of men in and they crossed the Rhine. It's not, even though it's an enormous feat, it, it didn't quite have that sex appeal to sort of stick with people's... Well, it's, it's, the, it's, the, yeah, it's, the, same as, it's the same as Arnhem, isn't it? You know, you think the, the, the amount of interest in, in Arnhem, I think, is increasing. If anything, you know, it's uh, when I talk to the veterans, they're always absolutely amazed that that people are interested and and remember it, you know, and they'll kind of say, we thought this would have been forgotten 50 years ago, you know, that nobody would be interested in 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 this thing, but uh, but people are people are they're gliders. I mean, what what were they actually like? I mean, they're obviously clearly not like modern gliders. I mean. I, <laughs> Is the word glider in itself even a misnomer? The, the gliders that we see today, the, the sports gliders, are actually sailplanes. The gliders that they were used in the Second World War were gliders. They, they were built to glide. They wouldn't ride the thermals. They're basically going to come down uh, uh, whether you like it or not. So the, the, the whole intention is to get as much equipment inside one of them as possible fly it over to, to, to the to the landing zones uh, and release it. There was three main gliders that the British uh, and, and the Americans used, and that was the Horser glider, the Hamilcar glider, and what we christened the uh, Hadrian, which was actually the American Waco CG4A. The Americans didn't use the Hamilcar, which was the, the, the glider that was big enough to carry a small tank. They didn't particularly like it. They didn't like the Horsa, but they, it was used. The Waco Hadrian glider would only carry about 15 men. 
the horse are fully fully laden, carry carry anywhere between sort of twenty five and twenty eight men, depending on the amount of kit they'd, they'd smuggled on board. They were mainly of wooden construction. The Hamilcar and the Horsa were of wooden construction, and they were built by furniture factories in the UK. They were built in component parts: uh, wings, fuselage, cockpit, tail, so on and so forth. Then they'd basically be sent to assembly airfields, but it came like a huge airfix kit basically. And then these were assembled mainly by women. The wings would go on, the cockpit would go on, the tail unit would go on, so on and so forth. The wheels, the, the landing skid, et cetera, et cetera, all be wired up. And the same went for the Hamel car. The Hamel car was enormous. And the pilots sit in tandem on the top of the aircraft. They sit in a bubble cockpit on the top. They had, they'd go inside, climb up a ladder onto the wing and then into the cockpit, close the lid. Uh, so they sat there up on the top. On the horse, they're both sat at the front next to one another. And in the Waco Hadrian glider, which is mainly tubular steel construction, then covered in canvas, uh, the, the pilots sit next to one another. That would easily carry a jeep and driver and passenger uh, in the back uh, or a combination of all kinds of different cargoes. Um, they, they had two pilots? Yeah, I had two pilots. The 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 Hadrian, the Waco. I'll call it the Waco. The Waco had um. Oh, let's call it the CG four A. Should be absolutely bang on. The CG four A had a uh, a swing over steering wheel. Uh, uh, so the pilots could take turns, and what they'd do is they'd swing that from one to the other. Um, I think there was another model which also had two steering wheels set in place. The Horsa glider which was much, much bigger. Uh, it was as big as a bomber. It was um, 65 foot long, 88 foot wingspan. And that would be could be towed by a Dakota, a C-47, if it was carrying men. If it was carrying any, anything heavier, heavier, like vehicles or uh, anti-tank guns or howitzers, uh, and it was a heavier uh, cargo, then you needed a bomber to tow it. Um, short Sterling, Halifax, um, and so on. Uh, the same with the Hamel car that needed a bomber to tow it. It was just, it was a huge aircraft, bigger than the Horsa. Whereas the the CG four A could actually be double towed by Dakotas. This happened a lot in Burma. Uh, they were used a lot in Burma. The Horsa didn't work particularly well in the Far East because the the heat and the humidity melted the glue, uh, and they were literally falling apart in midair. So they got a lot of the American um, CG four A's, which being tubular and canvas, tubular steel and canvas didn't didn't tend to fall apart. And they, the the C forty seven could double tow, so it would tow two of those behind it. This didn't take place in Europe until the crossing of the Rhine in nineteen forty five. That was the first time that that gliders were double towed in Europe. That must have been a real sight to see. But the British were trained on the CG4A at the time of the invasion of Sicily, which was July 1943. They were delivered by the Americans to North Africa, to bases in North Africa, in huge crates. The, so the story goes, some of the veterans have told me, that some of the fuselages went to one base and the wings went to another base. So they'd have to try and get these things all together in one place. When they got them all together in one place, nobody knew how to assemble them. So the U.S. Air Force, Army Air Force, sent a couple of engineers along and it was their job to show the glider pilots themselves how to take the, the, the component parts of the CG4As out of the crates and build them into operational gliders, which they did. And they lived in the crates. They made the crates into, into billets and lived in there um, while they were building the, 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 the gliders up. There was a need for horses to be involved in the invasion of Sicily, but they couldn't take them by sea. The only way they could get them was to fly them from Portreath in Cornwall all the way over to Sail in North Africa, which is, I don't even know how far that is, but it's a long way. Uh, The only tug that could take them was a Halifax, a modified Halifax, which had extra fuel tanks on board. And I think there was 30, this is off the top of my head, I think there was 31 involved in this operation which was known as operation uh, beggar slash turkey buzzard they managed to get about 20 something over there some of them crashed in the sea uh, some of them were shot down the tugs were, were shot at by by those huge german condor long distance aircraft and they finally got the horses over to uh, over to africa put them together with all the um, the CG4As. And then, of course, we had the invasion of Sicily in July 1943, which I don't know if you know anything about that, but that didn't go particularly well. 
the release height of the gliders was changed at the last minute. The tug pilots were Americans who weren't trained in towing gliders. The pilots of the gliders had something ridiculous like seven hours flying not only the CG4A but also the CG4A at night. So they'd never flown that type of glider before. They'd certainly never flown it at night before. And then they're in a major invasion um, expected to, to, to do all those things with uh, poorly trained tug pilots. American tug crews or American uh, cargo crews of, of Dakota's C-47s had a particular way of operating. They fly in a V-Vic formation, so there's one plane at the front and then two, two further back on its flanks. And the reason for that is that only the lead plane has a navigator on board. The other two planes don't have navigators. So whereas RAF planes, each plane has a navigator, it doesn't work like that with the United States Air Force, or it didn't then, rather. So they, 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 they were kind of off course. They were too high. They were too low. The golden rule of, of being a tug pilot is that you don't release the glider. The glider pilot releases the glider from the tug and he leaves the, the towing cable in place. The tug then peels off in either port or starboard and when he's a safe distance away he releases the the, the towing cable over the sea or over the enemy or, or or whatever but what was happening in sicily was the americans came under fire from the italian coastal batteries and they were releasing their gliders too high too far away from the coast a lot of those gliders ended up in the sea and a lot of men drowned as a result of that so that wasn't a particularly uh, successful operation. No, Hus Hus Husky was a steep learning curve for the Allies on the airborne all round, wasn't it? Because the paratroopers didn't do did do too well either. I interestingly, as well, once you've once you've got the Allies uh, that they got a toehold in Sicily, the Germans then brought in the German airborne. Uh, they brought in the Fallschirmjäger, which they landed operationally. The, 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 they flew in from Greece, I think. Um, and they landed operationally, almost simultaneously with the British and American airborne units. And they flew the, they had a, a, a glider called the Gigant, the Messerschmitt Gigant, which was a giant. It was absolutely enormous. It had two decks. The bottom deck carried vehicles, tanks, so on and so forth. The upper deck carried troops. This thing's got clamshell doors at the front. It's absolutely huge. They towed them across the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever side of the battle you're on, the, they were very, very slow, very low targets, and they were, they were pretty much all shot down out of the sky by the RAF, which is incredibly poor planning on the Germans' behalf. I, I, I will mention at this point as well that at this stage in the war, 1943, up towards the end of the war, German, the Germans used gliders massively, but not necessarily in an assault way. They used them as cargo aircraft extensively on the Eastern Front. Uh, they, had, they had three different types of gliders that they used in, in, in all sorts of different uh, operations, but mainly as resupply. Very similar to how the Chindits were using it in Burma. Exactly the same way, yeah. Exactly the same way. Uh, you cut off and bring, bring things in, keeps you going. Yeah, I mean, that's, we did it with D-Day, you know, Operation Mallard was a, was basically a massive resupply operation. Operation Tonga was the was the original sort of D-Day airborne assault. Uh, Mallard was much later that evening on the 6th of June, and that was, it, as, as well as troops, there was an awful lot of, of, of equipment and supplies came in. I think it was the same way for, for Arnhem. I think sort of the, the third lift, you're looking more at, at, at supplies coming in ammunition and so forth coming in gliders were basically they were they were the wartime equivalent of, of what we have now with helicopters um, if you think of chinooks and, and all the rest of it uh, and even the even the uh, even the hercules cg 130s i mean they're they're, they're basically a, a glider with with power <laughs> really you know it's, it's it's a huge cavernous thing just made to carry troops and, and equipment and vehicles were they fully trained pilots oh yeah they were fully yeah. trained pilots they, they went on a course initially to learn how to fly powered aircraft, Miles, the Miles Magister, Tiger Moth, uh, so on and so forth. The, the agreement with the RAF, who weren't particularly happy about training soldiers to fly. So the pilots were never part of the RAF? They were actually... No, 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 no. The misunderstanding is that they are RAF glider pilots, and that's not true. Later on in the war, before Operation Varsity and after Arnhem, 
the re- the regiment was so decimated after Arnhem that to make up their numbers, they took fully trained RAF bomber pilots that had trained in Canada uh, and elsewhere, and they did the the usual forces trick of volunteering them into the glider pilot regiment, as in you are now in the glider pilot regiment. A lot of those guys flew on the invasion uh, uh, of Germany in 1945, the crossing of the Rhine. They were RAF glider pilots. Up until that point, the regiment itself was an army regiment. They were trained to fly by the RAF and they were trained to soldier by the army. Once they'd qualified as pilots, they were army. They weren't RAF. But they'd go initially to their training schools where they were taught to fly powered aircraft. Once they'd qualified, they were given their wings and they were then qualified pilots. After that, they were then sent to, uh, that was EFTS, that was Elementary Flying Trains Training School. After that, they went to GTS, which is Glider Training School, where they were taught to fly the Hotspur Glider. Once they'd successfully passed that course, they were then sent to a HGCU, Heavy Glider Conversion Unit, where they'd be trained to fly the Horsa or the Hamel car. The veterans I've spoken to, not many of them have flown both. Some of them have flown both, but not many of them. If they were trained on the Horsa, they, tra- they tended to stay there. Some of them, particularly C Squadron, became uh, mainly Hamel car pilots. And then they'd go up, they'd go to battle school and, and 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 everything else. So they were the term they were they were given was total soldiers, being able to fly and fight. Are they difficult things to fly? I mean, is is it uh, or you sort of point it at the ground? Not according to them. I mean, I've I've only ever been up in in in, in a modern one sat in the back. When I've talked to the veterans, a lot of the veterans, what they had in common was that they just wanted to fly. A lot of them early on in the war. After the Battle of Britain, particularly, I think a lot of young men were the same. They all wanted to join the RAF and they all wanted to fly Spitfires. Obviously, you've got a massive glut after after the Battle of Britain where the RAF are saying, we, we literally can't take any more pilots. You can be a bomb aimer, you can be a navigator, you can be a tail gunner, but we don't want any more pilots. Of course, these, these lads are kind of saying, oh, I don't want to be a, a bomb aimer, I want to be a Spitfire pilot. So then they're getting called up. And the, the chaps I've spoken to, they've been called up into the RASC, the ROAC, the Royal Artillery, you, know, you name it. They've been called up into whatever. Then when the regiment was formed in 1942, there was a nationwide call for volunteers. And this was obligatory. So any camp that had been given the order to post up for volunteers, if any men came forward, the OC had to honour it and he had to send them for an interview. So a lot of these guys would see this poster, they'd be bored being coastal command or whatever they were doing, you know, moving boxes around, see the poster go up, pilots needed, I want to be a pilot, off they go to see the OC, put the name down on the list, the OC sends them down to London or wherever it is for an interview, could be a matter of months later, then they get the call to go for EFTS. They have to go off for their, their their flight training if they've been successful through their interview. And the veterans that I've spoken to have all said that all the gliders were very easy to fly. They all thoroughly enjoyed the powered flight training because they'd fly with an instructor, then they'd have to fly solo. So all of a sudden, within a matter of weeks, these young guys are flying a tiger moth on their own. The flying uh, Miles Magister on their own, and of course it's the it's the dream come true. It's what they wanted, so they love that bit. Then they get sent off to fly the Hotspur. Some of them didn't like it at all. Couldn't found it very difficult to get down out of the sky. It was a very lightweight uh, aircraft. Some of them didn't like the way it flew. But everybody that I've spoken to has agreed that the Horsa glider was the most beautiful and responsive aircraft that they'd ever flown. I haven't spoken to many Hamilcar pilots. The, not an awful lot of Hamilcar pilots survived. One th- major fault with it was, if it, particularly at Arnhem, if it hit soft earth, the whole aircraft went over on its back. And as they sit on the top in tandem, they're out of, uh, out of commission very quickly. You can imagine the whole weight of the cargo then comes down on top of them and, uh, and, and they're unfortunately 
casualties quite quickly. And I just haven't been fortunate to meet any uh, any Hamilcar pilots at, at this stage. But easy to fly? I don't know. I think you need a modicum of, of talent to be able to fly it. Once once you can fly, as far as I'm aware, they were they were easy to fly. What were the conditions like for the troops once they uh, you know once the personnel gets in the back and they're um, hauled into the air? That varies depending on who you speak to. So some of the some of the air landing vets that I've spoken to, South Staffs, Border Regiment, so on. Some of them would be sick the whole time. Some of them, um, some of them didn't just didn't mind it. What you do tend to find is any paratroopers that went in gliders. There was always a, a, a sort of happy rivalry between the two paratroopers and, and air landing, and you tend to find that most air landing chaps don't want to throw themselves out of a perfectly good aeroplane. And most of the paratroopers have never really landed in an aeroplane. That's not what they're trained to do. They go up and they jump out. So it's very unlikely. And when you do come across them, they'll say, oh, we went on a training course and we had to go up in a glider. I'll never do it again. You know, And, and they suddenly add a newfound respect for, <laughs> for their air landing uh, counterparts. I think the main problem with it is you, it's not easy to see out. So you, you kind of sat with your back against the fuselage. If you're lucky, you can see through the porthole opposite, behind the head of the chap sat opposite you. But then you're only getting a tiny glimpse of what's going on. If you want to see out, you've got to kind of turn around and look over your own shoulder. And if you're carrying 60, 70 pounds worth of equipment and a rifle and the guys sat next to you carrying all the same, that's a pretty difficult task. And I imagine if you've if you've been towed over the channel and you've landed relatively straightforwardly then the flight is as enjoyable as it can be in a time of war if however parts of the aircraft are coming off and the flak's coming up through the floor and the whole thing disintegrates when it lands i don't imagine that's a particularly enjoyable trip well that that is the next you know there's the next big thing i mean how how were the landings there's a differing in opinion in what the gliders were built to do a lot of people believe they were built to be crash landed they weren't particularly built to be crash landed. They were built to land. And if they could be retrieved, then they were retrieved. After D-Day, there was a special unit that went out and cannibalized all the surviving bits of horse gliders and bolted them back together. And they managed to make about 20 odd serviceable aircraft, which were then via a grass, grass strip, they were picked up and taken back to the UK. However, because you're using hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these aircraft all in in, in maybe two or three different landing zones you get collisions and because of the way they're made they're made from wood and, and canvas they do tend to fall apart on landing we've already talked about the Hamilcar flipping over onto its back the CG4A although it was made of a, of a different construction it was still very very delicate if you landed it wrongly it, it, the, the wings would literally just just drop off so some of the landings, as I say, they'd land on the on the. They had a tricycle. The horses had a tricycle undercarriage. They'd land on the tricycle undercarriage, and basically looking at them, they look just like they've, they've they're on the runway back at home. They're no different at all. If you look at any of the photographs, you'll see uh, the the alternative to that is gliders upside down, gliders in trees, gliders buried inside other gliders. Absolutely horrendous stories I've heard from veterans who were involved in Operation Varsity when they crossed the Rhine. The anti-aircraft fire was so intense that they were literally observing other other gliders being blown apart in the sky. And they could see the 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 the, the men and the and the, 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 the cargo falling out of these things. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. I do um a memorial every year at Polton in um down near Bath and that was the site of a a horse en route for Arnhem, which was carrying 21 uh, airborne engineers and two glider pilots, which started to fall apart in midair. And the canvas started to peel back off the wings as it was flying over. All the, all the, all the combinations, which was the tug and the glider, would take off from several airfields for both D-Day, Varsity and uh, Arnhem. And they'd, they'd, fl- they'd all meet up in, in midair at certain points and it was making its way to do that when the canvas started peeling off the wings the aircraft started to disintegrate in midair the tail gunner of the halifax that was towing them was observing this it plummeted to earth and because they were engineers they were carrying an awful lot of explosive the whole thing went up in flames and and all the men on board died they were the first 
casualties of, of, of the Arnhem operation, quite horrendously so as well. And that's marked every year in Poulton in the village. They've got a memorial set up and, uh, and Chalk go down there and, uh, and we put on like a little honour guard and all that sort of thing. I was sat next to an, a lady last year who was, I think she was 11 when it happened and she was out in the fields. They were picking, uh, picking blackberries or, or, or something like that. And she said she watched it come down. You know, she 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 was there with some some of the refugee kids uh, from the local school, and they they watched this happening right in front of their eyes. You know, so like with any kind of air transport, you, you've got a, you've got a risk involved. Uh, I suppose in time of war, when you've got hundreds and hundreds of aircraft in the air, you're increasing that risk the whole time, aren't you? So with the gliders particularly accurate, could they get them down? I mean. Um... How long from drop of the, from dropping of the tug, which hopefully has got it somewhere in the correct area, when, the, when once they're released, how far away from the drop zone and how accurate was it to get onto that drop zone? It was incredibly accurate because the way the RAF worked it, or the way the glider pilot regiment worked it, Colonel Chatterton, who was the the OC of the of the regiment, developed a, a method after Sicily because what happened at Sicily was it was the first sort of mass glider assault. And he realised that you've, you, you've been released all over the place and these guys are coming in, in all, at all angles, all onto the landing zone. And they're colliding with one another, they're overshooting the landing zone and so on and so forth. So he developed a plan which was, a, you can imagine it was like an invisible funnel above the landing zone. So at a given height, and these heights were all pre, pre-arranged beforehand, they were, they were, they'd be released at usually around about sort of two and a half to 3,000 feet and it'd be maybe kind of guessing a little bit because I don't have any documents in front of me, about half a mile away, maybe a mile away from the from the actually land, landing zone. And then they'd fly, carrying on the, the same coordinates, into this invisible funnel, which is difficult to, ex- to explain. But they'd, they'd fly into this invisible funnel and then follow it down into the landing zone. So at this point, all the gliders should be all travelling in the same direction all onto the same landing zone. So the way it works on board is that there's uh, two pilots. There's the first pilot and the second pilot. Without getting too complicated with who's the most qualified, the first pilot is the captain of the aircraft. He's in charge of that aircraft, even over any officer that's on board. That's how it works. He's responsible for that aircraft. The second pilot is his co-pilot. And what would usually happen is the first pilot would fly the glider as it was towed into the air. Once it was up in the air proper with the rest of the stream, then the co-pilot would take over and he'd fly it to its release point. Once at its release point, the first pilot would take over. Then the tug would signal either by radio telephone or by semaphore lamp. They would signal that they were ready to release. The pilot, the glider pilot, would then choose when he was at the right point for release. He would release himself from the tug. The tug would peel off, and then the glider would continue on its coordinates into this invisible funnel and down to the landing zone. It was extremely accurate. They were There, there was very few cases of the glider either releasing itself in the wrong place or not reaching the landing zone. If that was the case, there'd been misnavigation, particularly on a nighttime op such as D-Day or Sicily, where the, the tug itself had maybe misnavigated and taken the glider to the wrong place. Once the gliders were re- had released from the tug, they were pretty damn good at landing on target. If you look at Pegasus Bridge on the eve of D-Day, they were a matter of yards away from the target. All three gliders, they, they, they were incredible. They flew on a compass bearing. Uh, Walwork and, and Ainsworth, who flew the first glider into Pegasus. And you've got to remember for that up, there were six gliders. There was three to the river bridge, three to the canal bridge. They, they were towed across the channel by the Halifax tugs. The Halifax tugs actually carried a bomb load because the idea was to release the gliders, carry on flying and bomb a cement factory as a kind of a decoy so that the Germans would believe it was a, a regular, a, a standard sort of bombing mission. So they released the gliders, or the gliders released themselves on the coast. They flew on a stopwatch timer on a given uh, a given bearing. At a particular count, uh, I think it was 90 seconds, but again, so I'm, I'm kind of guessing a little bit. At a particular count, they then turned 90 degrees right, 
and another count turned 90 degrees right again. And Walwork and Ainsworth landed that glider, I believe it was something like 56 yards away from the bridge itself. The other two gliders that came in behind that glider, you've got to remember, they couldn't see him. They didn't follow him. They navigated themselves and they landed directly behind him. So the same thing occurred at the river bridge, except one glider was mistowed and he landed miles away at another bridge, which he believed to be the target. Everybody got out of the glider. They assaulted the target. They realized it wasn't the correct one. They realized their mistake. And then they made their own way through flooded enemy territory all the way back to their correct target on foot. It took them till the early hours of the morning, but they did it. It's incredible. So that's, that's how accurate it is at night on a stopwatch with a compass uh, and a map. And they managed to land pretty much the whole contingent of, of gliders on those targets, take those targets in a coup de man operation, which was obviously carried out by the, the Ox and Bucks um, infantry and, and, and secured those targets. And the same applies for any, any glider operation after that point as well. Their, their navigation was pretty good. Matt, if we could just take a moment for a quick word from our sponsor. In December's podcast, we looked at Winston Churchill and his role at the start of the war. Churchill is a fascinating character. If that episode of the podcast piqued your interest, you might be interested in the new online course being offered for free by Hillsdale College. You can find the details at hillsdale.edu slash www2podcast. You can take the course anywhere. The lectures will be emailed to you each week so you can watch them in your own time. I've done a few online courses and it's a great way to learn new things or reinforce what you already know. The course run by Hillsdale is Winston Churchill and Statesmanship. For exclusive access, go to hillsdale.edu slash ww2podcast. So Matt, back to gliders. Um, once they landed, was that it for the pilot? Was was his job done? Pretty much. The pilot is, is also responsible for getting the all the cargo off. If it's a live cargo, if it's if it's infantry, then they're responsible for getting themselves off. And there's a couple of ways they can do that, particularly on a horse. There's a door at the back of the fuselage, which opens, and there's a large cargo door at the front of the fuselage, just behind the cockpit, that also opens. So once the glider had landed, hopefully it's intact, hopefully everybody's conscious, although sometimes the, the whole load of them were unconscious. If they're all conscious, they get out and they form a defensive ring around the glider. At this point, the two glider pilots themselves, if it's a live load, they extract themselves from the cockpit, they take off the flying helmets, they put on their airborne steel helmets, they pick up their weapons, and they, they become airborne infantry. That's basically it. Their flying is finished for that particular operation. On the D-Day operation, they were all given a slip of paper signed by Chatterton, the CO, which was basically a, a hasty return chit and they were to get themselves down to the beaches as quickly as possible and return to the UK so they could be used, utilised again for any any follow-on operations. Obviously, at Arnhem, that didn't happen because they were completely surrounded in enemy territory. But the way they were intended to be used as infantry was more in a defensive role than an offensive role they were trained to fight just like any other infantry a lot of them had come from infantry units before they volunteered for for the glider pilots if they were if they were carrying in a six pounder anti-tank gun they were trained to use that that anti-tank gun and they would they would stay with that crew until such a time that they would then meet up with other glider pilots form small units and then form bigger units until they, they were big enough to go off. And particularly at Arnhem, they were used, one wing glider pilot regiment was used as defence for First Air Landing Brigade, I believe. Two wing, I might have this the wrong way around, two wing glider pilot regiment were used as defence for First Airborne Div HQ. So they were dug in around the Hartenstein Hotel. A lot of what you will see in photographs, a lot of those men are glider pilots as the battle uh, progressed at Arnhem they were then brought into that pocket around Oosterbeek and around the Hartenstein and they they worked together to form a, a defensive ring in the houses and in the slit trenches around that area 
so they were trained to use all the all the British small arms, all the German small arms, and also the cargo they were carrying. They had no vehicles of their own operationally. They did back in the UK on the bases, but operationally they didn't have their own Bren carriers or jeeps or lorries or anything like that at all. They'd have to hitch rides if they needed to. There was the same for the Americans and the German glider pilots. They just became infantry too. The, the Americans worked slightly differently. What happened on D-Day and at Arnhem was that the the glider pilots, and let's remember these men are extremely valuable because they, they're trained to fly. They're infantry, but they've got a, a massive, massive skill. So they would come together, they would form groups, they would form a larger group, and then this group would then be protected by other American airborne infantry. So they would they would then almost corral the glider pilots and secure them until such a time that they could be returned to uh, to, to home base. At Varsity, I think this had slightly changed. They became more operational, more like infantry, <laughs> for one of the better way of putting it. I think the German glider pilots were Luftwaffe pilots. They weren't army. They were they were Luftwaffe, as were the Fallschirmjäger. The, Fals- the German paratroopers were were Luftwaffe. They weren't army. They they were they were Air Force, uh, and the pilots were Air Force. I think they were trained to operate as infantry but my knowledge on 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 the german airborne forces is very limited uh, uh, over of the british really the um the 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 british used gliders in in burma i think it was operation thursday where the gliders were used um in force and and I, i seem to remember that the the first gliders to land carried the the bulldozer there's like an airborne bulldozer uh, and I think they carried several of them, and it was their job to to get out there and get these lands, these strips made very quickly. It's incredible. It's just incredible when you think about it. What an awful job! Because then you got stuck with, with the chindits because there was no you know ticket to come home unless they could get them on a little Lysander or something to fly them back. And well, those... no, the, I mean the, the initial idea there was I think it was uh, I think that that whole strip was christened Broadway, and I think the the idea was to get it cleared enough for more gliders to come in but ultimately get a landing strip prepared that would receive the, the Dakotas. That was the idea. It was going to be like a, what do we call them now, a forward, a, a, an FOB, a forward operating base, and that's what that's what Broadway was going to be. You know, it's... Uh... Um, you're, you, you're invited to um, regiments, the regiment's reunions. When you sit and talk to them, it's it's quite humbling, really, I find. When I sit and talk to the, to the glider pilots, I'm not particularly good at putting myself forward i'll kind of sit quietly and if there's a moment to talk to them i'll take it but i'm not i'm not much of a train spotter i don't kind of go and tug on the sleeve and you know can you can i ask you some questions and then when i do get to talking they'll say uh, ask me anything you like so i'll say oh well um can you remember what you had in your bergen and they'll go what the hell do you want to know that for and i go well it's it's interesting you know and they'll say no i can't remember what i had a, a jumper and my socks in there i don't bloody know what i had in my bergen but then they'll start talking to you about their their, their experiences. They're and, actually quite a lot of nothing in some respects, but they're quite interested yeah. in their uh, humdrumness. Yeah, exactly. But the th- you know, I can't I can't base it on anything. I've had a, a such a, a, a peaceful, easy upbringing and, and life. I, I've never I've never been under fire. I've you know had a few rough moments in pubs, but you know you you kind of sit with sit with these guys and just think, Christ Almighty! I remember one one of them telling me that. He was at Arnhem. Before he joined the glider pilot regiment, he was in the Royal Army Medical Corps. So he said as it transpired, as the battle got heavier, he was called on to to, to work as a like a medic. Uh, he said, which he did, he did readily, you know, and he had a, a, an orderly with him and he was doing the best he could. And he said that on the night of the 25th, I think it would be, they came round and said, we're pulling back down to the river. We're, we're going at, I think it was about eight o'clock on the 25th, you know, we got everybody form up at eight o'clock. And he said, I, I had, I had six wounded. He said, I had one guy that was paralyzed from the neck down. He'd been shot in the spine. And he said, and the others were all in equal states of disrepair. And he said, I, because he'd taken the Hippocratic oath, uh, Hippocratic oath, he couldn't, couldn't leave them. So he said, I, I stayed with them. And he said in the morning of the 26th came and he said it was quiet and everybody had gone. Everybody had pulled out and left us all behind. And he said, and then a, a lorry pulled up outside this house. And he said it was a German lorry and they all climbed off. And he said this officer and these, uh, I think they were SS, came up to the house, knocked on, knocked on the door. 
they opened the door and they, they said this officer in perfect English said to him, um, now look here, uh, we're going to look after your wounded. We're going to make sure that they get everything they require and then we're going to make sure that you're, you're taken care of. Uh, nothing to worry about. Excellent battle. And shook him by the hand, instructed his sergeant in German to, to look after this glider pilot and all his wounded. And he said in that it took them about two hours, but they did. They carried the wounded out onto the pavement. They loaded them into the back of the lorry. They took them off to the to the hospital, to St. Elizabeth's, and then him and his orderly were then taken down to Appledorn, where they were interred as, as POWs. But he said at no point would nobody shouted nobody held any guns to their heads it was just incredible and and, and he's just sat we were at the, the the reunion in bournemouth in this hotel and he was just sat telling me this story but then he showed me a photograph of himself uh, you know when he was in and he was so young he was so young you know with the brill creamed hair and and all the rest of it so what happened to the glad regiment after the war uh, it lasted until 1957 when it was disbanded and it reverted back to the army air corps in 1947 it used to wear the army air corps badge because that's what was formed first was the Army Air Corps, and the Parachute Regiment were part of the Army Air Corps until they got their own cap badge. The Glider Pilot Regiment didn't get their own Glider Pilot cap badge until 1947. After 1947, a lot of them were sent to Palestine, um, where they were used more or less as, you know, the, the rest of 6th Airborne Division were used in Palestine. And then they also served in Malaya, Korea... They were all over the place, and they were basically used. So they were still using gliders. No, not flying, not flying gliders operationally. They had they had some gliders in Palestine, but the terrorists got into the airbase and destroyed them all. <laughs> so they didn't have any gliders anymore, and they were only using them for training operations anyway. At that point, right. basically after after Operation Varsity in 1945, gliders ceased to be used operationally. The regiment was kept together, basically because they were an elite regiment. They were they were. M- Nearly all sergeants or staff sergeants or above. They were extremely disciplined. They were extremely motivated. And, and so you've got men like that on your books. You want to use them. So they sent them to Palestine. They sent some to Malaya in the Far East. Some were sent to Korea. And they, they operationally, they flew powered aircraft as like artillery observation, troop movement observation, things like that. And then in 1957, the regiment was disbanded. Uh, reverted back to the Army Air Corps as we know it today. They lost their Maroon Beret and the Ox- Oxford Blue. I think the Oxford Blue Beret was uh, was issued to them, and that's the that's the beret they were today. The link between the Army Air Corps and the Glider Pilot Regiment is incredibly strong. They're incredibly proud to have the Glider Pilot Regiment as their forefathers, and they're in- when, when when I speak to the Army Air Corps members of the Army Air Corps, they're far more passionate than, than i am about their their links to the glider pilot regiment they've, they've got a they've got a special room down at down at the middle wallet base the arnhem room which is all decorated with glider pilot paintings and memorabilia and and, and you name it um and they have them down there as guests of honor and and so on they carry the army air corps standard in the glider pilot standard at, at memorials and and so on but that's basically what happened to it. It's one of the, it's one of, if not the shortest lived regiment in the British Army, 1942 to 1957. Well, that would seem like a good place to finish. Thank you, Matt. For more information on the Chalk Living History Group and the Glider Regiment, you can find them on Facebook. Just do a search on Chalk Living History. Uh, don't forget, you can also find the podcast on Facebook, WW2 Podcast. And if you want to show your support for the World War Two podcast and would like to help support the show, uh, you can create a small recurring donation via Patreon. Uh, you'll find the details on www.podcast.com. It does help me cover the costs of the project. And a big thank you to all those people who've already made a contribution. Well, that wraps things up for this episode. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.